Chapter Twenty Two of the Pirate Woman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Pirate Woman by Aylward Edward Dingle. Chapter Twenty Two The Flight of the Fier Follette. Dolores, flinging herself down upon Craig Tomlin, seized his face between her hands and raised his head, placing her knee beneath it. She panted like an exhausted doe, yet the fire that leaped from her eyes gave the lie to her attitude of sorrowing humility. Her lips moved feverishly, but she could not or would not speak aloud. Tomlin's eyes were closed in agony. His teeth were clenched tightly upon his underlip. He gave no sign that he knew of her presence, and a sudden fury seized her at his irresponsiveness. She shook his head between her hands savagely. "'Wake! Speak!' she cried hoarsely. "'Art indeed dead at the moment of my triumph?' Tomlin's eyelids flickered, and his lips strove to speak. One hand went weakly to his face to grasp her fingers, and into her anxious ear he managed to whisper, Evil luck fought with me, Dolores. Yet I die content if you care. Care? she echoed, shaking his fingers loose impatiently. Care? Yes, this I care, bungler. I care because of all three of thee. Thou alone weren't covetous enough to obey my conditions. With thee alive there was hope of thy friend's speedy death. With thee dead, which of the others will wipe his fellow from his path for me? Why, think ye, did I fawn on John Pierce, but to arouse in thee the demon of jealousy? Why did I smile on Wiener and call him my Rupert, to steal thy arm against him? And for what? She suddenly laid his head down on the floor, leaned over him with her lips almost brushing his cheek, and whispered fiercely, Speak! Canst live? Tomlin's face lost some of its pain. The thin lips straightened into the semblance of a faint smile. His glazing eyes opened slightly. I am done for, he whispered. Dolores, kiss me again. I die for you. The beautiful fury sprang to her feet, spurning him. She glared down at his chalky face in utter scorn. Kiss thee? Thou die for me? Pah! I kiss no carrion. A half hundred men have died for me this day, I hope. I kiss him who lives for me and conquers, not the weakling who dies. Without deigning another glance at her victim, she turned away and went to meet Milo. He now entered with his slaves. "'Where are the two strangers?' she demanded harshly. Milo returned her stare with a look of simple surprise. He had seen nothing of them, and had thought of them being yet with his mistress. "'I saw them not, Sultana,' he replied. "'Saw them not? Great clod!' she blazed at him, clenching her hands in rage. "'Are they here, then?' Milo looked around in bewilderment. In all her life, Dolores had been his especial care. In her many moments of temper, she had perhaps pained his devoted heart, but never had she used to him the tone she now used. It seemed to his simple soul that the foundations of his faith were being wrenched loose. I will find them, Sultana, he said quietly, and turned to leave by the tunnel. Stay here, thou blind fool, she commanded him. I will find them myself. Here is work more fitting for a slave. How many chests are going to the ship? Three. And how many have ye yet empty here? Three, lady. Then get them quickly. Until I return, bid thy fellows replace the treasure that is still in the powder store. And haste, for I will leave this place this day, though all the fiends say no. She ran along the tunnel, and Milo set his men to their task. As he passed along to the powder chamber, a low moan arrested him, and he halted in sudden remorse for Pacharette, whom he now felt he had judged harshly. 
he left his fellows and went to the tiny alcove where the little octoroon lay and his great heart leaped in response to the worship that shone in her dark eyes he saw the dry and cracked lips the flushed face and fetched water and wine before he would speak to her then with her small head and slender shoulders against his immense chest he gave her drink soothing her pain with soft speech and caressing hand pacharette's wound was deep and bleeding internally a fever already burned in the tiny maid's veins she peered up at him wistfully all of her mischief all of her piquancy gone and replaced by a softened humbled expression that wrung milo's heartstrings will ye not kiss me now milo she whispered with a pearly drop brimming from each eye where laughter had so lately dwelt pacharette thy fault was great he answered yet in his face was a look so forgiving so excusing that the girl shivered expectantly and closed her eyes with a happy sigh yet the kiss was not given from the great chamber the angry voice of dolores rang out milo where art thou slave and the giant tenderly laid pacharette down again and ran in answer sultana blind idle dolt while thou art fondling that serpent of thine thy mistress's affairs may go hang haste with the treasure or feel my anger while thy useless eyes were mooning on nothing the strangers have escaped they are even now getting sail on the white vessel carry the chests down to the point as soon as ye may i will stay them yet and they shall learn the cost of flouting dolores hasten i tell ye milo winced at her address his black eyes usually holding the utter devotion of a noble dog glittered with tiny sparks of resentment yet the habit of years could not be lightly cast off and he bowed low even while dolores had turned her back on him and picked up a great empty chest to carry it to the powder store here in the flickering light of a pine splinter the slaves worked feverishly their abject eyes sparkling with borrowed radiance from the riches they handled and while they worked dolores emerged from the tunnel flashed one long glance of derision at the moving schooner and sped down the cliff to stop her flight the fieux follet was poorly enough manned with peters and his four men with the ready help of beener and pierce the getting of the anchor and the hoisting of the heavy fore and mainsails was an arduous job but it was accomplished under the tremendous urge of remembrance none wished to have the experiences of the past days repeated peters was anxious to get his beautiful vessel into safer waters the fieu follet's owner and his guest were doubly anxious to drop those blue hills of ominous memory below the horizon forever they gave scant attention to the three great iron-bound chests that stood between the guns along the waist getting clear occupied every faculty the tide setting directly on the point with a breeze dead in from seaward forced the schooner perilously close to the bar that had been her undoing before but with the lead going peters speedily found that his previous mishap must undoubtedly have been due to clever misleading after touching lightly once and getting deeper water at the next cast over the lee side he understood the trick of the extended false point and stood boldly along shore and as the schooner gathered steerage way hugging the point closely dolores ran out along the sandy beach and plunged into the sea abreast the moving vessel here's that vixen woman sir cried peters angrily looking toward Wiener for instructions peters had the helm and owner and guest stood against the companion ready to lend a hand at the sheets forward or aft Wiener and pierce stared at the swimmer then turned and gazed searchingly at each other in the face of each lingered a trace of the subjection they had fallen under neither could quite so quickly forget the allurements of this woman her kisses had been as sweet as her fury had been terrible and the absence of craig tomlin was an additional incentive to memory shall we take her away asked Wiener avoiding pierce's eye as he put the question can't you make more sail peters was pierce's reply Wiener laughed softly agreeably and the next moment 
Dolores hailed them. She swam swiftly with effortless ease, slipping through the sea like a sparkling nymph in her native element. But the schooner traveled fast, and though she lost no ground, she gained but slowly. She hailed again. Rupert, my Rupert! And finished the cry with a rippling laugh. Art stealing my treasure and leaving me? By heavens, Pierce, I had forgotten these chests, said Beener uneasily. Pierce regarded him closely, fearing that Dolores's spell was yet powerful. He gripped Beener tightly by the arm, leaned nearer, and said, Beener, so long as that blood-polluted treasure is on your deck, so long will you be unable to settle your mind. Bid the hands pitch it into the sea, for God's sake. A lull in the wind slowed the schooner down, and Dolores gained a fathom. Her fair face was set toward them in a bewitching smile, and she waved a gleaming arm at them. Wiener fought with himself in silence for a brief while, then with a shudder stepped to the wheel. Get the hands, Peters, he told the sailing master, and heave those chests overboard. Quickly! You shall lose nothing by this, but don't delay a moment. End of chapter 22 Recording by James K. White Chula Vista. Chapter 23 of The Pirate Woman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fatima Ansari from the beautiful land of Kashmir. The Pirate Woman by Elward Edward Dingle. Chapter 23. Stumpy Fires the Magazine. Milo and his slaves worked frenziedly at their task, his suddenly bitter spirit flogging them to unremitting haste. In the giant's troubled face, the smoldering spark of resentment had grown to an incipient blaze that required but a breath to burst into angry flame. One great chest was filled with the choicest of the gems in the powder store. It was set aside in the entrance beside the tapestry, and another box was opened before the powder kegs. Little Pascherette had ceased moaning, but from time to time a choking sob sounded from her alcove that increased the hard brilliancy of the light in Milo's eyes. The great chamber was silent as a mausoleum in the intervals between the clashing and tinkling of golden stones in the chest. From the outside, by way of the rock tunnel, came only the sigh and murmur of the crooning breeze, the softened plash of the tide on the shore, the scream of wheeling seabirds. All sound of the schooner had departed. There was no human note in the whole region. Then, as the second chest was almost full, and Milo pulled the third and last along in readiness, from the secret gallery behind the grove, came the shouts and oaths of men, weary, footsore men, but men with animal appetites whetted by the day of bloody conflict. They could be heard at the great door in the painting of the sleeping Venus. Not knowing its secret, their way was barred, but Stumpy's hoarse roar could be heard calling them back to the ledge, and there was a note of menace in his tired tones. And mingling with his voice was the voice of a woman of the camp, raised in shrill complaint milo stepped to the picture and listened i tell ye the fiend has tricked ye stumpy the woman cried tricked me have a care how ye talk that way woman stumpy's voice replied warningly i tricked ye and me and all of us even now come to the cliff and i'll show ye the scrambling of heavy feet could be heard in the gallery as men rushed out in answer how many men, Milo could not determine. But fewer than had followed Stumpy into the forest in chase of their broken foes. The slaves at the treasure chests paused in their work, alarm on their shining faces, looking ever toward Milo for instructions. Milo ran back through the great chamber and out by the tunnel to the cliff, peering around for Stumpy and hoping to see the schooner putting back. Without Dolores, he was at a loss yet he was not ready to leave his charge to be gazed upon by untried eyes. 
his breast swelled nigh to bursting at sight of the schooner. The Fufoyette was but half a mile away in a straight line from the cliff. She had been tacking against a light breeze and flood tide around the point, and while she had sailed several miles through the water, she had but just gained past the face of the cliff. And far from returning, she sailed farther and farther away as he watched, nursed with such skill of sheet and helm as proved to Milo's seemingly eye that her people would never return of their free will. And what of Dolores? His condor's vision picked her out as soon as the schooner. Her gleaming arms and shoulders swept rhythmically over and over, cleaving the sea easily and smoothly, her lustrous hair streaming behind her, and the sun glinting brightly from the gold circlet about her head. She was gaining foot by foot, and Milo keenly scrutinized the schooner for signs of surrender. There were none. At the schooner's rail, three heads were visible, but Milo knew neither belonged to Venner nor Pierce. That persuaded him that the schooner was unlikely to come back, and the even, tireless manner in which Dolores swam convinced him that she would follow to the end. Yet he would not utterly believe she had deserted him. He glared around for the men whose voices he heard now, raised in anger in chorus with the voices of the woman and her companions. Stumpy stepped out from the grove path with but four men behind him, and they were in sore plight. Stumpy himself dangled an idly swinging sleeve that was stained dark red to the shoulder. A red sear across his nose and cheek rendered him a demoniacal figure through the powder, smoke, and sweat. And his mates were tattered and cut. Their shirts bore red splashes to a man. Their grimed faces and fiery eyes held the passions of blooded men who see their reward flying from them. I tell ye she's gone for good, cried the woman who had brought the news to Stumpy. See, she's almost there, and three chests of treasure have gone in that vessel. Her swimming after it is but a part of her cuteness. Now do you believe, fools? The crippled, battle-scarred pirate glared to seaward with red-rimmed eyes in which flames of revenge started into life. His twisted, warped life had been spent in fighting and trickery. Today his work had culminated in a brave stand for what he thought to be straight and right. Reward he expected, but he earned it with blood and sweat, hoping at the last that some of his earlier transgressions might be atoned for in his loyalty to his mistress. He hurled aside the persistent women, who sought some reassuring word from him, and mouthing rather than speaking a call to his men to follow, he plunged again into the grove path, and stumbled toward the ledge entrance. Here he clambered painfully to the gallery, cursing to himself bitterly, never looking back to see if his men followed, intent only upon one absorbing thing. Revenge was beyond him, since there were left no subjects for his revenge. He had never seen the great stone at the chamber portals left rolled aside, could not even now imagine such a situation. No, if Dolores were gone in truth, and with her the strangers and the treasure, then it was certain, he thought, that the great chamber was sealed forever, and he would see into its mysteries, even though they proved barren now. He knew the way Dolores had shown him. Feverishly hunting for a flint, he tore some threads from his shirt and frayed them into tow. Then, with his cutlass, he struck a spark and ignited his threads, carefully nursing the tiny flame until he could find a dry stick. This lasted him until a pine torch was found and then he crawled along the gallery in search of the powder train. That he knew, for she had told him, would burst the rock asunder anyhow, and that would be enough, for he had guessed shrewdly that the gallery was connected with the great chamber by some secret egress. And who knew? Might not Dolores have taken in her haste but part of her vast store? Stumpy knew as well as Red Javez the tremendous wealth that had been deposited in that chamber of mysteries for he had been with the Red Chief from the beginning. He had seen with his own eyes the riches of a hundred ships taken in there, and never a thing come out. She can't have bagged a lot, he muttered, fanning his torch into a red flare. But she'll pay for deserting Stumpy, or Stumpy's a liar. He found the powder train, and the moisture had dried from it, 
leaving only a little line of dry, quick-igniting powder. He was not sure just where the magazine was, not sure how long the train would burn before the explosion. So down he clambered again, searching at the great altar for the water vessels he knew should be there. Then, with a jar of water, he returned to his train and swiftly swept up the dry powder and moistened it a little, making a rough, slow match of it. Now we'll see the sights, he growled, and went to the end of the gallery and flung his torch into the train. He watched it for a moment to be sure that it would burn, then stepped down from the ledge and drew back a safe distance to watch the upheaval. To what extent the mine was intended to destroy, he had no idea. He simply knew that Dolores had pointed it out to him as a means of defense should the gallery be carried in the attack. He supposed, therefore, that it would shatter the gallery. Doing that, it must surely dislodge or loosen rock enough for him to break into the great chamber with aid. The thought recalled his men to his mind, and he saw for the first time that they had not followed him. He started down the path toward the camp, shouting to them by name, eager to give them an inkling of the treat in store. But his hail was answered by another, and down the path a woman appeared running, her hair flying, and tremendous excitement in every line of her face. Stumpy, Stumpy, she sobbed and cried, in hysterical intoxication. Oh, Stumpy, the great chamber is opened, and it's full of gold and treasure. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 of The Pirate Woman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fatima Ansari from the beautiful land of Kashmir. The Pirate Woman by Alward Edward Dingle. Chapter 24 Milo Crosses the Bar. Milo watched Stumpy disappear down the grove path, and heard him call to his men to follow. Then he regarded the receding yacht intently for a moment, and the last vestige of noble devotion went from his face and gave place to a great and absorbing bitterness. In that instant, the foundations, pillars, and capitals of his soul shook and tottered. His universe changed from a thing of golden beauty and heavenly splendor to a shameful mockery of truth and faith. In that moment, his thoughts flew back to little Pascherette, and his great heart yearned toward her. False she had proved, but to what? To whom? He asked himself these things as he slowly walked back along the tunnel, not yet knowing what he would do. He answered his own question. Pascherette had proven false to falsity. She had schemed against the schemer, and, in the other tray of the balance, she had done these things for love of him, out of a deep and all-powerful ambition to place him, Milo the slave, in the high place of the wanton ingrate who had deserted her people. And the thought hurt him now. He had not yet yielded her the kiss she craved. Even now, the little gold-tinted one might be cold in death, denied that small consolation because of his obstinate heart. He ran along the tunnel and burst through the great chamber, cursing the idle slaves into silence when they cried their helpless queries at him. And straight to Pascherette he sped, to fling himself down by her side and seize her tiny, moist hand in frantic appeal. Pascherette, he whispered with a dry sob, little golden one, speak to thy Milo, speak and forgive. The octoroon gave no sign of life, and the giant dropped her hand and gently raised her pallid face. His lips sought hers in a passionate kiss, long and yearning, and slowly her eyelids fluttered and opened. The dark eyes were misty, yet that longed-for kiss had brought back her fleeting spirit to recognize her man. She closed her tired eyes again with a little sign, and the small, pale lips formed the words, I am content, Milo, my God. The giant bowed his head over her silent face, and his black eyes searched for a returning flicker of vitality. It was gone forever. Pascherette was dead. And Milo laid her down gently, 
and drew back to stare at her with growing rebellion and horror what gods could there be to use him thus he leaped to his feet with arms flung upward ha gods of earth and sea witness milo's penitence he said hoarsely to dolores i have given the worship that belonged to ye and ye have taken terrible atonement pity me he paced the small alcove nervously seeking light where no light was then the harsh shouts of stumpy's men resounded through the chamber and he stepped outside in alarm for it was not yet possible for him to discard the usage of years which forbade intrusion in that secret place he saw stumpy's four men standing open-mouthed in the doorway beneath the yellow lantern gazing ludicrously at the magnificence of the furnishings the slaves at the powder store stood where he had left them idle and aimless but with an open chest at their feet this now attracted the pirates attention and with a stamp and a shout they roared through the great chamber their faces awork with newly aroused avarice just for one second milo pondered staying them but his soul had soured he uttered a grunt of scornful disgust and waved a hand at them muttering revel ye dogs plunge thy hands deep tis all thine and the fiend's blessing go with it he returned to his dead pacherette and knelt beside her patting her cold hands and speaking to her softly and tenderly out in the chamber the pirates had hurled aside the slaves and flinging open the chests were glaring with wolfish eyes and dripping jaws at the bewildering mass of treasure revealed their noise irritated milo he went out again to stop them and he saw a pirate snatch up a glittering tiara and place it on his head with a roaring oath he saw another snatch the bauble off and in a breath the pirates were at each other's throats cutlasses flashed and a savage fight began at the moment the women stole in to see the mysterious place and one of their number ran to bring stumpy the giant glowered at the snarling men as at some repulsive beasts horrified that they should thus desecrate the quiet of his pacherette's deathbed he was not the milo of old now his memory had flown back through the years to the time when he was a youth of position and great promise in his own land when instead of being the cast-off servant of a beautiful ingrate he numbered his own servants by hundreds and a great dignity stole into his ennobled face he softly picked up the dead girl and advanced toward the rock tunnel stumpy met him at the door and the crippled pirate's eyes burned with the newborn lust of loot stumpy made as if to stay the giant with questions but he saw the snarling fight at the end of the chamber and caught the glitter of the jewels with the stumbling speed of a charging wounded bull he rushed in to join the battle running women brushed against milo in the passage all the camp's living people had caught the fever the giant strode on until he stood in the rugged rock portals and gazed once more over the sea the schooner had moved but slightly since he last looked at her and he could see dolores's head still advancing and very near to the vessel now the breeze had lulled perhaps preceding a shrift of wind and the visible people on the deck of the feu-foyette appeared to be running back and forth in indecision at milo's right hand the great rock sat on its ledge ready to fall at a touch and his brooding eyes flashed to it with terrible meaning inside the great chamber resounded with the clash of steel the shouts of furious human beasts and the shrill cries of women urging them on for there must be victors even to such a sordid fight and to the victors spoils where victors and spoils are there harpy women await them milo gazed long and passionately into the face of his dead then he laid her softly down outside the rock and arose with a fierce light irradiating his face dogs who would thus break the sleep of my beloved i give ye good for evil he muttered treasure ye crave treasure i give ye and none may take it from ye he turned put his hand upon the giant rock and started it from its bed and as he moved the mass the mountain rocked and crashed with the thunder of the bursting powder magazine down came the great rock pinning milo beneath it threatening in its final fall to crush him and the body of his love his great arms shot out and up 
Every muscle on his colossal frame stood out like ropes. His back cracked with a tremendous strain. He stiffened his knees, bit into his lip until the blood gushed, and a groan burst from his breast as he felt his stout knees stagger. His bulging eyes glared ahead over the sea. Into the air flew a thousand fragments of shattered rock. They fell and thrashed the sea into foam a mile from shore. Rocks fell upon his already overwhelming burden. His knees bent, and the blood trickled from his nostrils. And with his fast ebbing breath, he breathed his valedictory, fixing his stony eyes upon Pacharet as upon his deity. Gods of my fathers, receive my spirit into thy halls. Let thy swift justice overtake the cause of this upheaval, and receive with my spirit the spirit of the one who loved me. He fell to one knee, and a great sob shook him. The rock was falling in a shower about him. It rang and crashed on the gigantic stone that was crushing him. He bent his gaze in anguish afresh on the dead girl, now almost buried under stone and earth, and murmured, Pasharet, I come. I see beyond the blue ocean and the golden horizon the throne of my gods. Come, golden one, let us go. There will our faithfulness meet just reward. He pitched forward upon the dead girl, and the great rock crashed down, building them a tomb grand as the eternal hills. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 of The Pirate Woman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fatima Ansari, from the beautiful land of Kashmir. The Pirate Woman, by Elward Edward Dingle. Chapter 25. The Toll of the Gods. Benner's order to heave the treasure chests overboard was not given without a pang of regret. It was scarcely obeyed without threats for the sailing-master had been bitten by the treasure fever before his owner and guest came on board. Had they not appeared when they did, the schooner had gone without them, and Peters had already seen a golden vista ahead of him. He hesitated now, and Venner left the wheel vacant to urge him. Over with it, I say, at once. Here, Pierce, lend a hand here, man, before that witch's great eyes mesmerize us again. See, she smiles yet and comes nearer. Reluctantly, the seaman raised one iron-bound chest to the rail and poised it there. From the water astern rang Dolores's throaty laugh, even and full breathing, as if she had not swam a fraction of the half-mile she had covered. Foolish Rupert, she cried, never relaxing her stroke. Why waste the fruits of thy pains? Hast looked inside, then? Nay, take me on board and let us look together, Thou wilt not see Dolores drown, I swear. Then look once more into my eyes, my Rupert. She laughed again mockingly, alluringly, and Pierce turned away with a shudder, not daring to cast a glance in the direction of Venner. Throw the stuff over, I say, cried Venner hoarsely, and gave the chest a push that sent it into the rippling sea with a thunderous splash. And again that mocking laugh rang out astern. It was nearer, and Dolores's beautiful face was turned up to them with triumph in every feature. She had seen the struggle going on in her two intended victims. If she could but gain to within whispering distance of either of them, surely she would never let them escape her. Come, take me on board, my Rupert. I have a secret to tell thee, but thee alone, she cried, and spurted swiftly, gaining abreast of the main chains. But the eyes of Venner and Pierce were fixed in astonishment upon the tall cliff they had left. Their eyes stared amazedly, and they stood like statues, hearing none of her seductive words. What do you see? she demanded, frowning up at them. A score of sharp splashes in the water around the schooner startled her. She suspected they were hurling missiles at her, and one struck her arm. She turned swiftly, and her face darkened with fury. Then more small objects fell about her, and one struck her arm. She turned swiftly on her side to seek the source, 
and in her ears boomed the tremendous crash of Stumpy's explosion, rolling far over the sea, reverberating from the shores and making the air quiver like a solid thing. A great mass of rock hurtled overhead, missed the schooner by scant feet, and Venner shouted in horror, Throw her a line, Pierce, here quickly before she's crushed by such a rock as that one. The sea was shattered into foam for fathoms around, and every face on the Fafoyette stared over the rail in helpless astonishment. But on the face of Dolores glowed a smile of triumph. She feared nothing of earth or heaven. Among the flying rocks she swam on toward the schooner, smiling up at them, waiting for the rope that meant victory to her. And in the brief space before the rope hurtled out, down from the heavens plunged a high-flung piece of granite, fair upon Dolores. She seemed to sense its shadow, and in the moment it struck her, she half sank, breaking its force, but it followed her down. The mass struck between her gleaming shoulders, and she flung up her arms in despair, turning over and over with the impact, then floating unconscious close by the side of the white schooner that had been her goal. "'God, get her aboard!' gasped Pierce. "'She's done for, yet we cannot leave her there for the sharks like a beast.' Venner and Peters were already trying with boat hooks to catch Dolores's tunic. Pierce threw a line over the girl and drew her nearer, and the hooks took hold. They drew her up the side with a care that amounted to reverence, for in her unconsciousness she was more beautiful than ever. Her fine features molded in dead white, traced with fine blue veins. The grace of her form was that of a lovely sculpture now, lacking vitality, but possessing every line of perfection. The blow that had overtaken her had failed in its terrible threat to crush her. Lay her in the companionway on the lounge, said Venner. He ran to the saloon and brought up wine. He bathed her temples and wrists with the liquor and forced some between her blue lips, and Pierce chafed her hands and patted them, gazing down at her in silent awe. Venner, he whispered, when her eyes refused to open, we must let this settle the score against her. It's a terrible end for such a creature. For my part, Pierce, I would give all I have just to see those great violet eyes laugh at me again, to hear that mocking laugh from her maddening lips. God, will she never awake? Astern of the schooner, the sun was slowly descending to the western sea rim, and as the course was resumed after picking up Dolores, the point in the cliff gradually drew out across the path of the sun, until the outlines of the rock and trees stood out black and sharp. On the cliff top, a heavy pall of greasy smoke hung low about the shattered pirates' camp. From fissures high up the frowning side, spirals of smoke testified to the widespread destruction that followed the blast. They looked at the terrific devastation, and again at its nearer victim. And as they gazed down at her, Dolores's lips trembled in a faint smile. Her great eyes opened wide, looking directly and fearlessly back at them. "'I thank ye, my friends. I knew you would take me,' she whispered, and the two men turned away with a shudder. As she had lived, Dolores was now meeting her inevitable end, bold and indomitable. "'Where are you hurt?' inquired Venner lamely. "'Let me do something to ease you.' "'Ease?' she laughed as of old but her teeth clenched upon her lower lip immediately, with the pain it caused. I shall ask ye to ease me presently, good friends. Grim death has me by the throat already. But carry me outside, I am stifling in here. Let me see the ocean and the sky, at least in my passage, and I have something to tell ye also. On the gratings around the stern, abaft the wheel, they laid her on soft cushions. She drank greedily of the wine and water they offered her. She quivered with eagerness to unburden her mind before her thirst was quenched forever. She motioned them to bend over her, and began to speak in husky whispers. That chest, thou cast it overboard. Dost know what was in it? Both shook their heads. None had seen inside the chests after they came from the great chamber. I'll tell ye then for the peace of your souls and the tranquillity of your voyage. 
lest thy land be seized with a desire for treasure that shall work ye mischief have them open the other two chests quickly for i am faint venner went to the chests himself and flung back the lids which were bolted on the outside and not locked he stared for a moment unbelievingly then nodded to pierce pierce stared too in amazement and one after the other the sailors were called to see they saw two great strong boxes filled to the brim with iron chains broken cutlasses rusty bilbos and rock a fool's treasure in truth twas a trick to set my rascals at odds dolores told them when they returned to her to thee pierce i showed my treasure and i fear that blast has buried it beneath the mountain milo was to take it out i cannot believe it can have been taken away ere that powder blew it to fragments it was still in the powder store yes i know said pierce quietly it was that which precipitated the fight between us three that killed poor tomlin well if thou still art hungry for treasure my friends there is my store buried where thou knowest and i shrewdly fear but few of my people are left but i am slipping stand aside that i may close my eyes on the place i called home dolores ceased speaking and lay scarcely stirred by her faint respiration gazing over the schooner's stern at the sinking sun the golden disk was turning to red and across its darkened face the cliff and point stood out in sharp silhouette which grew larger as the great glowing sun was distorted and enlarged by the refraction near the horizon the breeze had changed and now blew with gentle strength out of the west a fair wind for their homeward course and the strands of dolores's glorious hair blew about her face like tendrils about an orchid of unearthly beauty presently she stirred again and now she summoned all her remaining vitality to raise herself on an elbow pierce and venner leaned closer sensing the end in the tremendous brilliancy of her wide dry eyes she spoke softly yet with a thrilling note of yearning that choked her hearers with harsh sobs father i come she whispered if i have failed in obeying thy commands i ask forgiveness for i am but a woman a woman with instincts and yearnings born of the mother i never knew thy very treasures that were to appease me put the yearning more strongly in my brain thy teachings showed me a world of beasts and savagery thy treasures gave me dreams of a world peopled by such as i would be my mother's blood forced me to seek this other better world thy blood forced me to seek it wrongfully she paused and gathered her fleeting breath then sitting suddenly upright she flung both arms out to the setting sun now lipping the sea and cried gods i know not yet must there be such else had i never known the devotion of a milo wherever ye be brave milo living or dead commend me to thy own gods and forgive me for my ingratitude she seized venner and pierce by the arms as she fell back and whispered in pity friends set my feet toward the west and launch my poor body down the sun path as it sinks into the blue caribbean that was my only home she relaxed with a little shivering sigh the glorious eyes closed with a tired tremor and the spirit of dolores the beautiful the wicked the tempestuous winged its way down the mysterious paths of the dark unknown come said venner suddenly shaking off his abstraction time is all too short if we are to render her this last small service how shall we do it asked pierce doubtfully we shall send her down her chosen path in a boat peters will load the dinghy with ballast while you and i will lay dolores out as well as we may bring me that grating pierce we will speed her in the dress she loved her soul would sicken at a suffocating winding sheet hurry for the sun is half gone swiftly they worked these men who had caused to remember the departed siren without great love and they placed her secured to a grating across the thwarts of the dinghy to which the grating was in turn secured then all prepared 
Peter sprang into the boat, bored a score of auger holes in the bottom, and as the great red sun set fierce and blazing behind the black profile of the cliff, the filling boat was set adrift, straight down the path of the luminary, bound ever westward until the sea gods claimed it and its passenger for their own. Farewell, place of ill luck, cried Pierce, as the schooner bore away before the rising evening breeze. May I never set my eyes on such evil shores again. Then you will not come back to seek the treasure? asked Venner, with a shadowy flicker of a smile. Not for a thousand times the treasure that lies there, cried Pierce vehemently. And I have seen it. The horror of this will haunt me until my dying day. I only hope God will look kindly upon that poor woman. That's all. I hope so, too, rejoined Venner thoughtfully. With a white woman's opportunities, what a woman she could have been. But the gods are inscrutable. Only the warm mantle of the setting sun gave a hint that Dolores might be even now entering into a place of eternal rest where her sins of ignorance and untutored instincts would not count too heavily against her. The sea is very benign to its elect. A calm sea in the setting sun received Dolores in arms of infinite benignity. End of chapter 25 An End of the Pirate Woman by Elward Edward Dingle